You set, Trey? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jim Smith. I'm the president here at Eastern Michigan University. It's my distinct honor to welcome you this afternoon to our Martin Luther King celebration sponsored by Verizon. As we commemorate the 36th anniversary of this auspicious event, we do so with a keen awareness of the systemic inequalities that still exist in our country. Since 1986, when the United States first observed this national holiday, honoring the legacy of Dr. King, this annual celebration has encouraged us to galvanize together, to talk about, to think about, and to act on change. So today we pause to reflect on our change agents here on campus who continue to advance Dr. King's legacy. And on the screen, you'll see this year's recipients of our MLK scholarships and awards. including our humanitarian award that goes this year to our critical infrastructure workers. This group of hardworking individuals includes our colleagues who are in custodial services, maintenance, dining services, police, and other like areas. These men and women continue to come to work daily in person since March of 2020, providing us with vital work for which without that work, we could not carry out our mission of educating the next generation of leaders. They deserve our continued recognition and our gratitude. Please join me in a virtual round of applause. Thank you. I now wanna take this opportunity to welcome a distinguished keynote speaker who's been with us today who came through some snow and some freezing rain yesterday, and I think one canceled uh, airline flight, Mr. Justin Hansford. Justin is a Howard University School of Law professor and the executive director of the Thurgood Marshall Center for Civil Rights. Professor Hansford was previously a Democracy Project Fellow at Harvard University, a visiting professor of law at Georgetown University, and associate professor of law at St. Louis University. He holds the BA from Howard and the JD from Georgetown, where he was the founder of the Georgetown Journal of Law and Modern Critical Race Perspectives. Professor Hansford also has earned a Fulbright scholarship to study the legal career of Nelson Mandela and served as a clerk to someone we know in the Detroit area well, Judge Damon Keith on the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Justin's a leading scholar and activist in the areas of critical race theory, human rights, the law, and social movements. He is also the co-author of the forthcoming seventh edition of Race, Racism, and American Law, the celebrated legal text that was a first casebook published specifically for the teaching of race-related law courses. His interdisciplinary scholarship quite impressive, I might add, has appeared in academic journals at various universities, including Harvard, Georgetown, Fordham, and the University of California. Professor Hansford also is a member of the Stanford Medical Commission on Justice and Equity. In the wake of the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, Professor Hansford worked to empower the Ferguson area residents through community-based legal advocacy. He co-authored the Ferguson to Geneva Human Rights Shadow Report and accompanied the Ferguson protesters and Mike Brown's family to Geneva, Switzerland to testify before the United Nations. He has served as a policy advisor for proposed post-Ferguson reforms at the local level, state level, and federal level. He has testified before the Ferguson Commission, the Missouri Advisory Committee on the United States Civil Rights Commission, and the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. 
Please join me in welcoming our distinguished 2022 keynote speaker, Professor Justin Hansford. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I, I want to start off by thanking President Smith and the Martin Luther King Celebration Planning Committee and all of those who came together to make this day possible. Um, as mentioned, I was mentored by Damon J. Keith, one of the best uh, people in the history of the state of Michigan, in my opinion. And he was someone who served as an inspiration to me and also someone who helped to lift me up in my career as a young attorney. And I actually hope that we take this days like today uh, as an opportunity to thank those of uh, those in our lives who have lifted us up and who have paved a way for us like Judge Damon Keith has. And um, actually, I hope that you take, take the time to even write down a couple, the names of a couple of people who have served as mentors for you. And remember some of the gesture, gestures they made to make your life and your career and your pathway easier. Uh, so I do wanna take this time to celebrate Judge Damon Keith as well. So um, today we're gonna talk about this question of protests. The theme for this year's MLK celebration is we the people speak, no justice, no peace. I'm gonna talk about my experience as someone who has chanted no justice, no peace, and someone who actually has even been in jail as a protester. The thing about being in jail is that there's nothing to do. The novelty wears off <clears throat> after about five minutes. In my case, my cell was maybe 10 feet long, eight feet wide, with a toilet, a faucet, and a sink. On the right was a metal bunk bed. Everything was made of cold metal. The mattress was thin and hard and worn and musky. I'd been arrested earlier that day at a Walmart in Maplewood, Missouri, Maplewood, Missouri a few miles outside of Ferguson. Uh, until that time, I had never even seen the inside of a jail, not even for a field trip. At the protest, I wore a neon green hat labeled with the words legal observer and had my phone on recording mode. I was supposed to observe protesters, not to be a protester. Shortly after the police arrived, the manager of the 24 hour Walmart closed the store. Simply by standing in the store after it was closed, I became a trespasser in the eyes of the law. Immediately a police officer came up behind me jerked my arms behind my back and handcuffed me. So I asked, uh, what did I do? The officer replied, shut up, and then shoved me out of the store headfirst into a squad car, the metal handcuffs pinching my wrists. There were other legal observers also standing next to me in the store, but I was the only black one and I was the only one that was arrested. I sat inside the squad car, bent sideways, and sitting on one leg as the protesters outside continued to chant and uh, the legal observer hat, the neon green hat that was supposed to serve as my armor against arrest had fallen off and uh, was lost. I spent the night in jail and I was released in time to teach my law school class the following day. While I had already found community and solidarity amongst the Ferguson protesters, after my arrest, I became even more personally involved and invested in the movement. My experience revealed to me the unequal protections inherent in the First Amendment. I emerged from my protest in Ferguson with less confidence in our society's willingness to justify and to balance the values of freedom of speech and also equality. The First Amendment itself 
it is pretty it's pretty easy to read congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances to many the First Amendment stands out as a central example of American exceptionalism. This is supposed to be the foundation for all of our freedoms. But in the way I was treated as a Ferguson protester, in the way so many of us who have been protesters in the Black Lives Matter movement uh, have been treated, perhaps we need to rethink whether or not our First Amendment is applied in a way that should make us proud or should make us ashamed when it comes to issues of racial justice. Dr. King was a protester himself. The, the theme for today's uh, Martin Luther King celebration, We the People Speak No Justice, No Peace, is appropriate because Dr. King himself was a protester. And his protests almost always were what we call productive protests. And I'm going to talk to you about why protests can be productive and why Dr. King's commitment to protests as someone who was jailed over 30 times in his life is not only something that should be an inspiration to us all, but also is a teachable moment for us. So we can learn not just that there is not enough justice in society, but also we can learn that there are more voices that our society has yet to provide space for. And there are more ways for us to create change in society in addition to the traditional avenues of litigation, going to court, or even going to Congress. I learned these lessons as a student studying critical race theory. Now, this is an idea idea that has become much more controversial in the last couple of years than it was when I was a student in law school helping to found a law journal on the subject back in the early 2000s. One of the first law review articles I read as a young student studying critical race theory was an article by prominent legal scholar Richard Delgado called Storytelling for Oppositionists. What Delgado uh, covers in his article is the importance of counter narratives, the importance for people to have the opportunity to tell their side of a story, the story, especially people who have found themselves marginalized or pushed out of the global conversation on the issues of the day. Why did Professor Delgado thinks storytelling was so important for oppositionists. It's, it's true that there is a lot of data that gets consideration when people in power make important decisions that affect us all, but they don't always know what it feels like to be a young black man walking down the street and to see a police car drive by and the police in the car stare you down. They don't know what it feels like to be a young woman who has to walk down the street late at night and not be sure whether or not you're going to get home safely. They don't know what it feels like in the case of Dr. King arguing that we needed to end America's segregation laws for us to have to endure the pain of seeing signs that say no dogs and no blacks allowed. But story, storytelling, allowing marginalized people to tell their side of the story in their own voice provides an opportunity for that feeling, for that emotion to become part of the discussion. Also, storytelling allows there to be a newfound sense of urgency added to the discussion. Simply having someone's voice heard in their own words in their own um, language changes the way we consider issues as policymakers. And of course, it's also true that simply having the ability 
to hear other speakers increases our own capacity to make informed decisions. This is a lesson I learned from another critical race theory scholar, Mari Matsuda. In her study of, of storytelling called Multiple Consciousness, she talks about how important it is for people to be able to think both in terms of logic and in terms of emotion. Why is this relevant? One of the most impactful and transformational moments in the civil rights movement was the sit-in movement. For those of you who are not familiar with the sit-ins, in 1960, uh, students began taking buses down to the South in segregated uh, restaurants, going to segregated restaurants, sitting at segregated lunch counters, illustrating what would happen when the lines of segregation were blurred. The image you can see for yourself was jarring in its brutality. Here you see young students of all different races being assaulted as they simply tried to order a sandwich at lunch counters. This narrative, the narrative that was told by these students, they didn't have to go up and say once upon a time to tell their story, simply providing this image, simply having their story become part of the discussion, served as a counter to the mythology, very prevalent at the time, that segregation was peaceful, that segregation was something that was desired by both Blacks and whites, that segregation ultimately wasn't that bad. This power of narrative completely changed the trajectory of the civil rights movement. In a similar way, when Mike Brown was killed on August 9th, 2014, there were many different discussions that covered what happened. Some people said Mike Brown was no angel, you know, he was a young guy who was, uh, you know, not necessarily always on the up and up. Maybe he had stolen some cigarellos from the corner store. Maybe when the police officer pulled up next to him, he had uh, responded in a way that was full of disdain. When that narrative about Mike Brown, a young black man was told throughout the press, in 2014, people began to realize that there was an opportunity for a counter narrative to be told that Mike Brown, whether or not he was respectable in the eyes of the law, did not deserve to lose his life for a small act of disdain or even for an act of shoplifting. As uh, the, the project of retelling Mike Brown's story, providing a counter narrative, allowing Mike Brown's mother to be able to tell us who Mike Brown was as opposed to depending on the word of the police themselves, we began to see pictures like this, Mike Brown as a high, school, a high school graduate, Mike Brown as someone who was on his way to college, Mike Brown as his mother's son. This counter narrative served an important purpose in helping people around the country and even around the world to realize that there is more than one side to the story, even when police kill unarmed black men and it seems like the police version automatically becomes the official version. Another example is Eric Garner. So many of us have seen this video so many times and they see these pictures and it's common to conclude that Eric Garner should not have resisted. And as unfortunate as his killing was, so the mythology goes, if you want to stay, stay safe, do not resist. But more and more, as we understand the importance and power of providing our own side of the story, advocates like the late Erica Garner, who worked so hard to, to uh, support 
the cause of her father that she died an early death, began to tell us and tell the story from the perspective of structural racism. Yes, Eric Garner was selling loose cigarettes, but why is it that Eric Garner was in such an economic situation that he had to sell loose cigarettes to survive? Why was it that Eric Garner was in such poor health that the applying of this pressure was almost guaranteed to harm his body to the point of death? Why is it that Eric Garner was someone who had to, uh, to call for help and nobody even was going to respond, even police officers who were standing there at the moment, right? So the retelling of Eric Garner's story, just like the retelling of Mike Brown's story, was an opportunity for us to create a counter narrative as a form of protest in the case of Black Lives Matter. The other point about protests is that they allow us to think more about questions around issues of justice. Professor Derek Bell, who's often seen as the founder of critical race theory, very memorably posed the idea of the lawful protesters dilemma. Essentially the dilemma is so many protests that follow all of the regulations and requirements are immediately forgotten in history. But oftentimes the protests that do most to illustrate the stark contrasts and injustices in American society are protests that are unlawful. One example of an unlawful protest was a protest that took place in Birmingham in 1963, led by Dr. Martin Luther King, who was both, both a protester and a thinker, and as you can see, someone who was in violation of the law and was arrested. During Dr. King's unlawful protest, he famously took the time out to think about questions of justice and articulate his perspective in what we call the letter from Birmingham jail. This is a piece of philosophical reflection that has gone on to be studied by professors, theologians, scholars, and has been rated as one of the most profound intellectual documents of the 20th century, written from a jail cell. Dr. King expresses his discomfort with the perspectives articulated by uh, moderates, particularly white moderates, who wanted him to avoid breaking the law when trying to make his voice heard. These moderates respected the importance of counter narrative but they wanted to see it done through things like pictures, stories, not time spent behind jail bars. Dr. King responded and said, you express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954 outlawing segregation in the public schools, it is rather strange and paradoxical to find us consciously breaking laws. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer is found in the fact that there are two types of laws. There are just laws and unjust laws. How do you tell the difference between a just law and unjust law so that you could, like Dr. King, decide when, not if, but when is the correct time to engage in protests that could be unlawful. Dr. King says that an unjust law, if you go to the second point here, an unjust law is difference made legal. An unjust law is a law that a majority compels on a minority to follow, that it is unwilling to follow for itself. Segregation was a classic example of that. 
So through this process, Dr. King decided and articulated his philosophy as to why it was fair and good for him to break segregation laws. These types of discussions around when protests become unethical and when protesters should break laws are the types of discussions that can only be had when protest edges up to that line. These are some of the questions that are asked over and over again as protests challenge our conception of justice. Like Dr. King said, what is the distinction between just and unjust law? This perspective was famously challenged by a Harvard law professor who said, Dr. King, what if the segregationists decide they also were in the right and they also were justified in breaking laws? In this case, breaking Brown versus Board of Education, the law calling on them to end segregation. How can you be sure that this will not be a slippery slope. This is the type of the debate that Dr. King's protests encouraged. Dr. King also had a debate with another scholar, Howard Zinn, around this question of whether or not you can only break specific laws that are unjust, like segregation laws, or whether you can break more minor laws like trespass laws as part of your process of illuminating injustice. Another discussion as is to whether or not this hope of ever being able to get an ultimate just outcome through legal reform alone was in itself a hollow hope, meaning that we needed to break laws to get to, to the point of justice in the first place. This is called the hollow hope. All of these different philosophical debates are only made possible by people being willing to take the streets as they did in the Birmingham campaign in 1963. Set the scene once, I'll set the scene once again. Dr. King, after ad, being an advocate since the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955, decided to break the law in 1963 when Bull Connor, the local uh, public safety commissioner, outlawed any protests in Birmingham a couple of days before the Birmingham campaign, denied the a license to use the streets for protests, Dr. King said, we're gonna go protest anyway. We're gonna break the law. What happened is unforgettable. Water hoses, <clears throat> dogs sit on children who are protesters. An injustice caught on camera for the world to see, shown all around the globe, demonstrating that, look, folks, we have a discussion to have around justice in America. These philosophical debates that I talked about earlier are the types of debates that Dr. King had to have with himself and with his co-leaders before, before ultimately making these decisions which illustrated for the world that injustice was taking place. But this is not the only instance in our history where we could see the injustice of police responses to protests being a discussion point being a launching point for more serious interrogations of racial justice in the United States. Some of you may be more familiar with this dichotomy. Even as recently as in the last two years, many people have discussed the clear distinction in the way protests against police brutality in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd were policed, as opposed to the way the January 6th insurrectionists were responded to by police. Another example would be the Charlottesville um, 
riot and how police responded to that. So these images of police response to protests, the discrepancy between how police respond to some protesters and others throughout history have been the type of illuminating, I'll even use the word performance, that display for the world that a question of justice needs to be had. So when we are thinking about the process of creating change, how it is that when we the people speak, we can actually change American society. This is an, a, an arithmetic, an example of arithmetic that I think we all should take the time to consider. I'm not saying that this is the ultimate equation, but it's something that we should present on all of our, our chalkboards in math class. Counter narratives plus the illustration of injustices equals changing the wind, changing, what does it mean to change the wind? To change the temperature in society, to change the environment, to change people's hearts and minds, and ultimately to change the way the wind blows, to change the, the direction in which our society is moving, maybe even to change the laws themselves. This is a phrase that was uh, created by another one of my um, heroes, Professor Lonnie Guineer. She also clerked for Judge Damon Keith here in, in Michigan. Uh, Harvard law professor, scholar, and critical race theorist who argued that oftentimes it is not the senators, the congressmen, the judges, or the CEOs who ultimately will decide how our society will move forward on questions like equal justice under law or racial justice. Oftentimes it's the protesters. The protesters are the ones who change the wind. Classic example of that that is talked about is the example of John Lewis, a protester like Dr. King, a protester who decided that in order to articulate and illustrate the need for change on the question of voting, he and other organizers against the advice of many in the civil rights movement would move forward with a protest on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, even when police had said that this is an unlawful gathering. John Lewis was famously assaulted, injured, hit on the head with a baton that evening, but not too, too, uh, too long after that, he was standing across from the president of the United States, Lyndon B. Johnson, being provided with the pen used to sign the Voting Rights Act. Now the relationship between the march on Edmund Pettus Bridge and the signing of the Voting Rights Act is the relationship that Lonnie Guineer articulates is the relationship between counter narratives and the illustration of injustices, which happens when people protest. So one of the many brilliant insights of Professor Guineer's scholarship is the insight that reminds us that our laws, like the Voting Rights Act, like the Civil Rights Act, which many people trace to Birmingham, our laws are not exactly written in the Oval Office or in the halls of Congress. Our laws are not exactly written with ink on dry parchment. Many times our laws, the laws that do the most to, sh to change the wind are laws that are written in places like the Edmund Pettus Bridge or written in places like Birmingham. So 
So when I when I think about free speech in the age of Black Lives Matter, and when I see protesters speak out for George Floyd or Mike Brown or Sandra Bland, I don't only see people out there chanting, causing disturbance. I see potential change makers. I see potential lawmakers. I see people who, if they are in the process of protest, if they are providing a counter narrative, if they are using their protests to provide an illustration of injustice, I see people who can make ultimate change and even new law. And in the age of Black Lives Matter, we have seen the outcome of protests. One of the things that I argue, and I love to hear from the students in terms of their perspective on this, I argue that the Juneteenth holiday that we celebrated for the first time as a nation last year, of course, in black communities, especially in places like Texas, we've been celebrating that for generations. But the national commemoration of Juneteenth is directly attributable to Black Lives Matter protesters. I would also argue that the changing of the sport team, sports teams' names, like the Washington football team in the place where I live, the increased amount of representation in the media with so many new uh, shows on, on platforms like Netflix that now suddenly have a category that says uh, uh, movies with a strong Black lead. Even the convictions of Derek Chauvin, the convictions of the, the lynchers of Ahmaud Arbery, all of these are outcomes of protests. All, are, all of these are examples of protesters changing the wind. Now, you see there's a blank space here on purpose on the question of policy because we still have not had our voting rights moment as a Black Lives Matter movement. One of the things that made Dr. King so powerful was his ability as a protester to communicate with the presidents and with the Congress people so that the protests ultimately resulted in change in policy. The move from protest to policy was one of Dr. King's most, most significant contributions. Right now we have the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act unsigned. And so there's a blank space on this page where it says policy changes. We've got uh, the Movement for Black Lives uh, bill to do even more aggressive changes in terms of policing unsigned by the president, unpassed by Congress. So we have on, this ongoing question of whether or not we're going to have an ultimately uh, law-giving moment when it comes to the Black Lives Matter movement. But I wanna take this time to say for me, in my view, I am confident that we will have that moment. So in my last couple of minutes, I wanted to discuss a few of these ongoing First Amendment issues, just so we can understand how important it is for us as a society to remember that our First Amendment opportunity, our chance to change the wind is at risk. And even though this little equation, I'm gonna, this is the professor and me, I'm gonna go back one more time to the arithmetic. Even though this equation may be something that many of us have not consciously seen articulated. And so we may not be consciously aware of this equation. There are many in society who are aware of this equation and they're trying to stop us from changing the wind. There are laws that are being passed around the country to make it illegal for people to engage in many of the types of protests that Dr. King and John Lewis engaged in. Even more so, they're making it in some cases legal 
to do things like uh, somebody blocks the street during a protest to, to hit them with the car while they're protesting. These laws are being passed all over the country and we're seeing efforts to respond by groups like Color of Change and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, the ACLU, the National Lawyers Guild. But these are the types of things that we have to continue to think about as a country and here even in the state of Michigan where many of these laws have been defeated, many of these proposals have been defeated, we have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do to ensure that these narratives are going to continue to be part of our discussion as a society? Another First Amendment issue is the banning of critical race theory happening in states across the country. So we have seen, and many of you may already be aware of the efforts to ensure that the work of scholars like Lonnie Grenier, like Derek Bell, like Richard Delgado, like Mari Matsuda, many of the words even of Dr. Martin Luther King and stories about Dr. Martin Luther King, many of these precious jewels in our society are seen as dangerous and are being banned around the country. There's a campaign called the Truth Be Told campaign. Is going to try to convince you that we that need to I want to, I want to, I want to play a quick video to demonstrate what some of the efforts to respond to this are going to include. If you can get the the right the uh, technology here together. But I want you I want you to be aware of the effort and what is being done to respond to it. Banned. Let's see, can we get this to go back? Critical race theory. Intersection app. We may not be able to start this from the beginning. Structural racism. Okay, we're good. so this is on the website uh, aapf.com. So I'm going to play just a clip of this so that you can get a taste for some of the work that is happening to try to respond to the bans on critical race theory. Implicit bias, diversity training, and the 1619 Project. But understand that this organized, well-funded, and coordinated campaign isn't an honest debate about these ideas. Most couldn't even define what these ideas are. And that's the point. They want to scare and silence our society back to colorblind submission, where George Floyd and Black people's killability is just a natural, everyday feature of American life, unproblematic, unchangeable, and disconnected from the history of anti-Black racism. From the criminalization of abolitionist literature to the McCarthy-era witch hunts, We've seen the government respond to liberatory movements through the repression of anti-racist ideas time and time again. If you are concerned about these efforts to censor history, to muzzle anti-racist speech, to expand voter suppression and to criminalize protest, we urge you to join us in standing up for racial justice. We need to fight back like our lives depend on it because they do. So this is, a, this is a campaign that I participate in as part of my work at the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center. So I want so feel free to contact me if you're interested in working on that campaign in the future. And there's one more campaign I want to raise to your attention, national restrictions on voting rights. Some of you might have heard the uh, governor or lieutenant governor or others talk about the restrictions on voting rights happening in most states, as many as 49 states around the country, we are seeing a number of bills. You see in some states like Texas, as many as 24 bills being passed to restrict voting rights. And when it comes to questions of making your voice heard and being part of the conversation in, in society, we're talking about the ballot box, the classroom, 
and also in the public sphere, three places where your voice matters, three places where you can allow your story to be part of the decision-making process, three opportunities to illustrate your perspective and to show how injustices in society must be cured, three of these very important platforms are currently being restricted in today's society. So to me, this question around free speech is not just a question about whether or not you're gonna be able to say what you want when you're pro gonna protest. The question of free speech is a question as to whether we as a society are going to allow ourselves to have the power to, in the words of Lonnie Guineer, change the wind, to make society a better place. So just in closing, I'm happy to have this conversation with you all, but I wanna say in closing that these questions around protests, these questions around voice, these questions around whether or not we are going to change the wind are questions that are not short-term, but long-term. Questions that are not just questions around race and issues around inequality in the United States, but questions that will be forever debated in societies around the world. Another one of Lonnie Guineer's most famous books is one in which she uses this metaphor of the miner's canary. She talks about how so many times the issues that affect our country and our world are first illustrated by the disproportionate impact they have on minority communities. Environmental justice issues are issues that have impacted black communities and brown communities more than any other. Voting rights, issues involving uh, education, issues involving criminal justice. The minor's canary metaphor is one that we should always remember. When we attack issues of racial justice, we are not just addressing one particular minority group. We are raising issues that will ultimately make the difference as we try to move forward as a society in general. So with that, I would like to thank you all for taking the time to, to listen to my discussion. And I'm really eager to hear more about your questions and your concerns when it comes to issues of critical race theory, protests, the First Amendment, voting rights, um, any of these issues that were raised. And I hope you all have a wonderful Martin Luther King holiday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Justin. We really appreciate your conversation and your sharing your experiences with us and also giving us research and resources and just the history on protests. It was just very insightful conversation. Thank you so much. I have a few questions from our EMU wonderful students. Wonderful. And I'm gonna ask you the questions and then you can answer them. So I'm hoping that all of them are viewing. The first question is, what is the best way to encourage empathy, understanding and motivation to improve race relations? Great question. I am of the opinion that empathy and understanding does come from telling your story. It is more effective and more persuasive to tell your story than it is to provide data, than it is to provide um, some sort of persuasive argument. I'm a lawyer, so I think about those things. Um, I would say even more so than to show videos right as especially if you're a student and you have a relationship with a classmate or with a staff member or a faculty member and you're able to share your own experiences and how you may get a pit in your stomach when you feel as a, a young person of color when the police officer comes around and questions you where you may feel particularly isolated 
when issues um, are covered in a classroom in a very dismissive way, that that hurts, that packs a punch. That packs a punch more so because that friend, that colleague, that person that you're in a relationship with will have a more in-depth, in empathetic relationship with you and will be able to be moved, I believe, from having those conversations. So for, so for me, I, when, I, when I was talking about storytelling and counter narratives, right? It's more effective from a community perspective to, to have a group of people go out and have their voices heard through protests to me than it is to write a article. But if you are in an opportunity where you're in community and you don't, you're in close relationship with someone or with others, and you're trying to get them to understand where you're coming from, have conversations. Maybe that means uh, in this time and age, maybe Zoom calls on, on questions of equity in your, on your campus. Whatever it may mean, find ways to, to I, I hate to use the term leverage your relationship, but what you're doing is actually building on relationships to create empathy. That's the most effective way to do it. Unfortunately, when you're talking about society-wide questions, people don't know each other, so they have to use forms like protests in the media. But in, on a campus, use your relationships. Thank you for that. That was a great answer. Next question. In your position as an executive director, what is your favorite part about the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center? And thank you for all your work. All right, thank you. The, the, the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center um, is, you know, that's my, my pet project. It's been four years now. It was founded on the philosophy that um, all of these ideas around critical race theory as inspirational as they are, are, are not at their best unless they become pract practical, praxis. So I use the term praxis, which means merging theory, like critical race theory, and practice. So the, my favorite part about the Thurgood Marshall Civil Rights Center is its praxis. The fact that we, we have guest speakers, we read book, we have a book club where we've read books together, the new Jim Crow or um, you know, other books. And we, we, we invite scholars to, to work with us on projects. And we then translate those ideas into community organizing projects or sometimes lawsuits. Sometimes we work on um, policy projects. Right now, one very interesting project we're working on is one around mental health led by uh, the mother of Mike Brown, Leslie McSpadden. I'm still on the board of her foundation. And her vision is uh, to create a structure and ultimately to pass a law that would make it mandatory for the government to provide mental health support for anyone impacted by police violence. And she speaks to that issue from her own personal experience as a mother who has had to go through so much trauma after the killing of her son, Mike Brown, who has seen the police officer who has killed Mike Brown in the community many times, just in going to the grocery store, things like that, and has had to be re-traumatized, who has had to tell her story over and over again and to relive that story over and over again. So her, her foundation currently provides mental health support for mothers, of those who were killed by police. But her campaign is to make that something that happens by law in the state of Missouri, and then possibly in the country as a whole. And uh, we're working with uh, you know, a number of uh, Congress people to try to make that a reality. So that's one of the, the most important uh, examples to me of how we can take our ideas and our philosophies. And we know that, for example, mental health is at a crisis level in terms of its, um, you know, the importance of it in our communities. And, you know, there's, there's studies that show that every time one of these videos goes viral, it's like a George Floyd video or an Eric Garner video, uh, the impact specifically on the Black community uh, is 
the equivalent, it increases blood pressure, it increases stress. It is the equivalent of uh, three or four days of bad physical and mental health for all members of the Black community. So we're talking about tangible health consequences and tangible mental health consequences for people being traumatized and afraid and worried about their own loved ones. And, um, you know, this, this is just a crisis issue when we're talking about mental health. So to be able to work on issues that are so important to our society and our community, to be able to work with advocates and uh, inspirational people like Leslie McSpadden, and to be able to take ideas from our scholarship and make them a reality, that's really one of the things I'm just so over the moon to be able to have the opportunity to, to participate in that. Well, I am so grateful that we have you working on this project. Mm -hmm. Next question. What is the one thing you think college age students can do to combat voter suppression? Great question there. I think, of course, students need to register themselves. They need to make sure that they are involved with providing support for those who are organizing uh, voter initiatives. Um, at our, in, our, in our case, one of the things that we're doing, we've been able to work with uh, the Advancement Project in Georgia, uh, which uh, also works with the, you know, um, a, the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference, which is an organization of Black churches to get the word out about what the new voter restrictions may be in your community. Here, we focused in Georgia, for example. So we worked with the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Conference to put together a PowerPoint explaining what the additional restrictions are. We went out into uh, the community on Zoom, of course, uh, did a town hall, shared with community members, church members, what it is they needed to do to register now that the laws have changed and try to help more people register according to the law. So as a college student, one of your real advantages is that you have perhaps more free time uh, than most people who are working for a living. I know it's hard to, I know it's hard to imagine, but you, you do have the opportunity to volunteer. Um, in some programs, you have, you have a certain number of hours that you need to use on volunteering. So volunteer with an organization that is doing voter outreach. Volunteer with an organization that is doing public education on voting rights. And uh, you'll find that you can make a real difference. You can really not only contribute your own voice as a voter, but you can really impact the likelihood that dozens, maybe hundreds of additional people uh, may be able to vote by your involvement in voter education initiatives. Great, great advice. This is a long question, so I'm gonna take my time with it. Mm -hmm. Do you feel social media movements like hashtags are more beneficial or harmful to Black Lives Matter movement? That is, is it okay for movements to become a trend or does this ultimately jeopardize the seriousness of the topics? That's a that's a complex question. The, the use of social media in the Black Lives Matter movement, to me, changed the discussion and allowed many of the protesters themselves to uplift their own voice and to lead the discussion in a way that had never happened before. One of my friends, Jeray McKesson, uh, was at the forefront of that in Ferguson. And um, I'm very thankful for that. It's also true that social media has its limits. Uh, 140 characters or something on Twitter. And this, the, the simplification of issues is it's a skill that is very uh, difficult to master. And so without the discussion being led by scholars or experts in the field, it's also true that hashtags can confuse people. Many people, for example, this is an example, 
Many people don't even know what Black Lives Matter really stands for. Many people don't know Black Lives Matter because it gained prominence as a hashtag, it became malleable. What I mean by that is uh, people who opposed it were able to focus and say that this is evil, Marxist, whatever. People that supported it were able to say that, well, this movement is meaningful to me because they're in alignment with my way of seeing things. Both of those sides could be wrong. Both of them could have a, many times, both of those sides are wrong and what they think Black Lives Matter is, right? So, uh, and, and again, a hashtag driven movement, as opposed to in the civil rights era, you had an organizationally driven movement with structures that emerged from the black church or from the NAACP or others, um, you know, more, um, you know, traditional organizations, it is something that we're still adjusting to. So it's hard to make the call on whether it's better or worse, because on one side, you have much more of an ability to disseminate your message. Many more people can uplift their voices. On the other, on the other hand, there's a lack of clarity because there's so many different voices. So it's a very complex question. There, there are books that are written about these types of issues. Uh, one book is called Twitter and Tear Gas. You know, another book is called, um, you know, uh, well, just a, a number of books. I can provide more readings if people are interested in it. But this is the type of thing that scholars write entire books on. So I, I can't give you a, a complete answer in the, in uh, two minutes or less. But that's a great question. Okay. Maybe I, that maybe that student can write a paper on it for I, one of their classes. Hopefully, they'll recognize their question and <laughs> be able to go back. I have another uh, couple of ones that are mm -hmm. not more thought provoking as well. Do you think the recent debates regarding critical race theory were ignited by the new wave of political correctness? You know, I do believe that it is an offshoot of that discussion. And when um, people talk about the First Amendment, too many times the political correctness discussion comes right behind that. Um, and this idea that we should all be free to say anything we want. And if you don't like what I say, uh, or if you talk back about what I say, and you respond that you don't agree with what I say, then you're violating my First Amendment rights. And so I have, so this idea that the First Amendment includes the right not to be disputed is, um, you know, falls under this political correctness discourse, where people are feeling as if they there's some sort of law against being politically incorrect. What's often happening, it is true that people could be in a position where they lose jobs or lose friends because they're politically incorrect. But the First Amendment is a, uh, about a law. It's the Constitution, right? The First Amendment of the Constitution. And it's about the question of whether or not there's a law which would allow the government to punish you because of something you said, right? That is separate from the question of political correctness, which is about your friends and family or your acquaintances disagreeing with something you said, right? Now, coming back to critical race theory, what is at the base of this, you know, for people who don't know, have any idea what critical race theory is, who've never heard of Lonnie Guineer or Derek Bell or Kimberly Crenshaw or Mary Matsuda, what is at the base of this is this belief that there are certain views, usually around race, that are being forced onto their children they feel like if they oppose those views, they're being politically incorrect. So they're, they're leaning on their lawmakers to use the law to actually ban people from saying stuff, which is actually, to me, the real First Amendment issue, right? The, the discussion we have to have around political correctness is um, if people are made uncomfortable by your position, that is not illegal and that is not wrong, that is reality. 
If you think that if you have a position on race that makes people uncomfortable, then you have to be able to be prepared to face the consequences of that. That's my view on it. All right. And to be upset that it's the people who are going to be upset or being politically correct, you know, that is to me, that's a discussion that's away from the law. And it should not be something that's regulated by the law. So it's, it's, I hope that's clear. So there are a lot of people who oppose critical race theory who are arguing that, well, this is political correctness that they're now trying to. Critical race theory is political correctness. It's being woke, quote unquote. You're trying to force this woke, political correct information onto my kids, and I don't want you to do that. That's that's the that's the opposition's viewpoint. That's in my view. That's what I see it as. My response to that is, you cannot deny people the opportunity to look at data to look at scholarship, to look at facts on issues around race and have honest conversations about it. And trying to, to stop that because you believe that any discussion on civil rights that makes you uncomfortable is political correctness, that's just, that's a mistake and it's gonna hurt our country in the long run. I hope that's not a too convoluted answer, but you know, it's a, it's a, very, it's a very complex question. Thank you for your clarity on that. Mm -hmm. Now this one is a little bit different and they want to know, what advice would you give your younger self at the start of your career? Sure. Um, did they say what age? No, they did not. <laughs> <laughs> they say last year I was younger, right? Um, well, let's say if I was a student student at Eastern Michigan, you know, maybe a sophomore or something like that, my advice would be to find a way to determine um, what your passions and what your natural abilities are so that you can be very clear on what your purpose is, your professional vocation. I believe everybody has a vocation. I believe we have God-given gifts that um, are either in the arts or in athletics. Uh, I believe I have a gift for law and um, you know questions of justice. In part because that's what I'm passionate about, uh, in part because I've done things like taking these um, personality tests, uh, Clifton Strengths Finder or Myers Briggs, all those things I took as a, a student. And uh, it is true that um, I have been pretty happy with my career choices because I was able to find something that I was really passionate about, that made, you know, I was emotionally invested in it and also i found a way to contribute to something i was passionate about with uh, my natural abilities i was always good at reading and writing and things like that i was very i was terrible at art you don't want me to try to sing <laughs> you know you don't want me to do, do too much math the math you saw on this powerpoint is about as much as i'll ever be able to do uh, so i knew my strengths for the most part and my weaknesses and I knew what I was passionate about. And uh, that combination of finding something that was important to me and that I naturally had some proclivity to be successful in, it's allowed me to be uh, somewhat successful in that area. And then some of it's out of your hands, you know, some of it is just being in the right place at the right time, you know, being a good person, working hard. So I, I'd always give someone the advice of, um, you know, hard work and honesty and all those things, but also find something you're passionate about and know yourself, know what, know what it is that you're good at, know what it is that you're bad at and try, try to eliminate some things early on uh, so that you can focus on your strengths. I'm going to ask just a few more questions and then we'll okay. wrap up for today. Uh, one question was an interesting one. What is a few ways you would recommend young Black youth to get involved in ac uh, activism and politics? And how can you help provide more information to the community? Good question. Is, is it all right if I grab a drink really quickly? I have, my throat is a little parched. We will bring one, to, bring one you. to me. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, I brought a little. All right, so... 
Thank you, Justin. Could you repeat that question? Yes. So in, in, what, in, a few, in a few ways, what would you recommend young Black youth to get involved in acad, uh, activism, excuse me, and politics to help with the issues in the Black community? So how would you get students involved, college-age students, what would be some suggestions to get them involved in their communities? Join an organization. That's something that uh, is, it's not as, uh, prevalent as it was during, say, Dr. King's day, when almost all of the organizations, you know, the NAACP, Southern Christian, you know, Leadership Conference, all those organizations were really the place where people under, understood that involvement happens. I say that because too often today, some people believe that you can be a Twitter activist. And some people believe that tweeting about an issue or putting a very articulate post on Instagram or even TikTok, which I, I don't know how to work, but this social media activism that I talked about earlier, the hashtags, uh, you know, that works for people who have a million followers like DeRay McKesson or for celebrities. But if you're a, just a college student who's just looking to get started and making a difference, I, I'm going to give you a, a dose of um, reality. Your tweet probably doesn't make a difference. You know, I mean, and if you are able to communicate to people in your community that you feel strongly about an issue on social media, you could do it even more directly by contacting them or having a Zoom call or speaking in a meeting or in an organizational setting where you can have a back and forth. And to really make impact, you have to work as a collective. I personally believe strongly in the power of collective action. I, I'm, I'm not an individualist. And uh, the reason Black Lives Matter is something you've heard about is because thousands and millions of people have come together around Black Lives Matter. It's not because of only Colin Kaepernick or only Patrice Cullors or only prominent individuals, DeRay McKesson. It's not because they as individuals have made an impact. It's because of the collective organizing, the collective protests. And when you, when you come together as a collective, only for big events like hashtag around, you know, I, from what I heard here, there have been incidents on campus in terms of vandalism or uh, things around, uh, you know, a noose in a dorm room or some graffiti. Those events can be inspirations for people to come together for a short period of time and have a meeting or a protest. If you look closely, what has, what has happened six months later? It's over, it dies down. In contrast, if organizations are formed, and if you have a, a budget that the you know, student government organization, and you can put together a plan to deliver a, um, some rec a set of recommendations to the university that you can follow up on because you'll still be around as an organization so that they can be, there can be officers in the organization. So when, when seniors graduate, the juniors can pick up on it, right? When you have an organization in place, you can see collective action actually bearing fruit, right? The response becomes less about performance and more about productivity when you're in an organization. So I've, I really implore students, you can see I'm passionate about this too. I implore students to take one lesson from the last eight years of Black Lives Matter. Don't settle for a hashtag, don't settle. In life, don't settle, but especially when it's organizing, don't settle for a hashtag. Create an organization, work together, make sure that organization has staying power, 
and come up with a plan that is a medium to long-term plan. I, one more thing I'll say, I, I was a student activist myself and uh, you know, no offense to uh, <laughs> our president and administrators who I know do, do not engage in this, but there's some administrators who will say, well, these students are protesting, you know, let's just wait them out. These students are mad, let them graduate. And then the next students will forget all about the issue, right? Because if you, if you organize as an individual small group around an individual event, time will pass and people will move on to the next. But if you join your NAACP chapter at the school, if you, if you join an organization that is going to have staying power, you can create a plan and work collaboratively to really make sure that there is some meaningful change that happens in your institution. So, pl so please join an organization and don't, don't think that you can tweet your way to injustice or, or to fighting injustice because tweeting is not gonna get us free. That's, that's one, if there's one thing to take away from this question, tweeting will not get you freedom. Or, working and organizing and uh, being part of a collective is the way to go. And one last question, which is a follow-up to the previous question. What are two action steps you like the students at EMU to take today, or even one immediate and one long-term? What would you like us to do? And then again, there is a thank you for being with us today. All right, thank you for inviting me. I, re I, really, I really enjoyed this. Um, you know, I'm looking at an empty auditorium right now, but I'm picturing all the faces that I saw earlier today, and um, I'm enjoying the back and forth. Uh, so, what? What? One more time. So, what is? What are? What are two things that they can do? That they can take. Uh, what do you, two things that, that you would like them to take away after your speech today? One that is immediate, and one that is long term. Two action steps. So, action step number one. Uh, this was very intentional in terms of me giving a presentation that listed a number of scholars in the field of critical race theory. So action step number one is Google these critical race theory scholars. Google Lonnie Guineer. Google Derek Bell. Google Richard Delgado. Google Mari Matsuda. You can even Google me if you want, <laughs> but, uh, but, but Google the scholars uh, because you're, you, you students are brilliant. You're in, you're in, you're in uh, a very prestigious university. You have access to scholarship in the way that the average person, they may not be able to read and understand these documents. You can read and understand. So you should read and understand critical race theory. When, um, People talk about critical race theory on the news nine times out of 10, they have no idea what they're talking about. But what's more concerning is I think it would be very difficult for them to go through the, the uh, literature review to have a grasp of the field, but you can as students, you can do that. So read the scholars on these issues. Don't ever believe that you know it all when it comes to racial justice protests, just because you are, you know, you have been in a protest or something like that, or if you've experienced racism, that doesn't mean that you will not learn a lot from these scholars. So the first to do for all of you is read the scholarship on uh, these issues, these civil rights issues, so that you can really understand what is being debated. And uh, the second to do is, um, you know, in honor of you know, Dr. King's holiday, many people have said that this is not just a holiday where you take off, but this is a day when you actually do service. So find a way to, if you can't do service today, commit to doing one act of service in the near, near future before the month is out. Whether it means, um, you know, going to, you know, hand out food at a food kitchen, I know we're at the time of COVID, so maybe it's something you do online, but find a way to contribute to the community and maybe even join an organization. Join an organization, read the scholarship. So that's three things. Read the scholarship, do one act of service, and join an organization working on an issue 
involving social justice. And if you do that, I believe that you will really be helping to live out Dr. King's legacy. And we'll be very, I'll be very, very um, excited if you do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. So Professor Hansford, on behalf of all of us at Eastern Michigan University, thank you for joining us. Um, and thank you for your presentation and do not be a stranger. Um, come back soon. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So right. everyone who is watching, we are encouraging you to go back and replace some of our programming from our kickoff to academic programs. In addition, this year, in lieu of the presidential luncheon, we're asking folks to donate the cost of a ticket um, to our crowdfunding campaign. Go to donate.emish.edu slash MLK 2022. And you can donate what you would have given us in the cost of a ticket to the MLK Celebration Fund. It will allow us to elevate what we do here at Eastern in addition to give away more scholarships to our students as they finish out their academic careers here. We thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you all back here next year for our 2023 MLK Celebration.